Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the NBA Front Office Show. Trevor Lane here, joined by Keith Smith. Before we get into everything today, quick reminder, the season is almost here. Preseason is almost here. Media day, training camps, all of that good stuff. We're going to be covering all of it. Make sure you are subscribing to the YouTube channel. Hit that like button and go subscribe over on the podcast feed as well. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is you listen to podcasts, just look for the NBA Front Office Show. We're going to keep you up to date on everything going on in the NBA world. Keith, we get to start today's show out with a little bit of a bang. Yeah, the <laughs> trade market is always exciting, but three, not one, not two, but three MVP candidates Teams are keeping a close eye on them to potentially hit the trade market in the near future. We're talking about Giannis Antetokounmpo, Joel Embiid, and Luka Doncic. Uh, this this NBA world it just it just never stops, and now we've got three more big time players to keep a real close eye on. Yeah, and this came out of uh, Woj was talking about this. I don't know if it was on NBA Today or Sports Center or where it was, but but he was basically saying it was it was in relation to things that could be holding up a potential Damian Lillard trade. And where we know everybody's tired of the Damian Lillard stuff, right? Either tell us when he's traded or tell us when he shows up at camp. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today. But that's kind of what sparked this whole thing was. Teams are reluctant to go all in on giving every asset for a guy like Damian Lillard, knowing we can only be a year away from Giannis and Bede, maybe Luca. I think Luca's probably a couple years out at least. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what teams are thinking about. And this is kind of that multi year roster planning that, that teams do, especially when they think a you know major superstar player, which all three of those guys obviously are, uh, could become available. So uh, that that's definitely going to be something we may see a slower to develop trade market a little bit. Then it may be one of those where it's more in season trade deadline type stuff where it's all right. Hey, we're really good. We're probably not getting Giannis or Embiid or Luca in a year or two. So let's go all in right now, get this guy or these guys and really make our playoff run. Uh, that could be something that we see happen as a result of all of this. So I agree that I think Luca is a, a little bit further out than the other two, than Giannis and then Embiid. But it's interesting that if you're a team that's looking at going after Damian Lillard, like, I would rather have Giannis. I don't think this is a hot take at all. I'd rather have Giannis. I'd rather have Embiid. Age being a factor, but also just just quality of player. I think if you just told me straight up yep. which one would you prefer, I think I would rather have Embiid. I'd rather have Giannis than Lillard, who is a fantastic player in his own right. Although look, we know this, maybe for the the Lakers fan perspective, right? I can recall times where the Lakers were maybe hesitant to move assets for a player. Of course, Paul George being the infamous one back in the day, he wound up getting traded to the Thunder instead. And now look, he's with the Clippers. Um, sometimes the what's the saying? A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, sometimes yep. when you have the opportunity to get a guy, you just got to do it because the future is not written. You don't know for sure that that opportunity is going to be there down the road. Now, I think there's enough with Lillard with his contract, with his age, that teams are teams can be a little bit hesitant there regardless and then if you add on top of it that hey there might be something better down the road maybe that's enough to cause them to to pull back and that does seem to be what's happening here but if you have the opportunity there in front of you it's it could be a dangerous game wondering if what's going to come along next is going to wind up being better after all yeah and it's not that this is exactly apples to apples here, sure. but it's like the Knicks for years. It was, well, the Knicks are waiting on LeBron. The Knicks are waiting yeah. on player X, you know, Y, Z, you know, then we can flip back through the start of the alphabet. <clears throat> the Knicks had, you know, for years and years, that was the thing. And then they never got those guys. And that was always a, a major uh, talking point with, with them was, they do all this stuff and line everything up and then they never get the guy. And then, you know, where do we go from there with that? So that's one of the things. Now I think it's funny because it's already being mentioned, you know, well, the Knicks may be waiting to make a run at, you know, Giannis or run at Embiid or maybe even a run at Luca uh, down the line. And, and I thought, um, you know, some people have said, 
but are they? Because it seems like this new front office is, hey, if that's there, sure, we'll get involved. But we're not going to go crazy. We're not putting all our eggs in that one basket, as we saw with Donovan Mitchell. They did not go you know, to the absolute extreme ends of everything they could have traded to get Donovan Mitchell. Instead, they pivoted and went a different direction. And that's been a part of why I think the Knicks have been a better, more stable, successful mm-hmm. franchise over the past few seasons because they're not just – kind of pinning their hopes on we're going to get superstar X. And if we don't, then uh, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Instead, they're moving in other directions and then still kind of keeping everything together. If, if we can make a run at that guy. And I think, I think that's the right approach that teams should be taking in these situations is yeah. You know, if you can get the guy, great, go get him. But if not, you know, keep, keep, keep things moving along. Like, like I don't think Miami is any, is in any way, going to say, well, you know, all right, let's walk away from the Dame trade and we'll just, you know, hope mm-hmm. we can get one of these guys in the next, you know, two or three years. I think they're still, you know, trying to find a way. We obviously know to get Damian Lillard right now because for them it's let's get this right now. And then you know what? We're the Miami Heat. If we want to get in on Giannis or the other guys, we'll figure out a way to get in on them too, you know, down the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, of those three guys, and in fact, let's kind of remove Luca because I think you're right. Yeah. It's going to be a few years down the road. Giannis, Embiid, this time next year, are they still with their current teams? I'm going to lean towards yes because I think that's always the more likely, but I think we are in range on both of them for the first time realistically that that's in play a year from now. I can see almost no way either guy is traded this year. And that's been kind of the buzz is like, if you're the Bucks or the Sixers, do you get out ahead of it? And I think they're both like, if you're the Bucks, especially, it's like, okay, hey, whoa, wait, we're trying to win a title here. Mm-hmm. Like we're one of the better teams. You know, they're, they're a top, you know, depending on where you look, three to five title favorite. So for them, it's no, like, well, we're going to figure all this out. And beyond that, we're going to do what we need to do to keep him around. And then when you've got Embiid, obviously Daryl Morey has said everything is designed around Embiid and Maxi and staying a title contender. So I, I think what it takes is disappointing seasons for you know either one of them. And then going into you know next summer, you know, when we're in June, leading up to the draft and the start of free agency, them making it known. Um, Hey, I'm I'm done here. I'm not coming back. I mm-hmm. want to be traded now. Giannis in a little bit of a different spot because he'd be going into you know, the final year of his deal at that point. He would have a player option after. And Bede's got another year uh, to go. So so we'll see. You know, kind of where that one goes. But that, I think that's what it'll take. It'll take one of the two of them. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a uh, you know full fledged get me out of here, trade me now today. But I think it'll be a hey, I'm giving you the heads up kind of thing and that's you know almost more appreciated in a lot of ways of all right let's try to work on something so when i'm looking at these situations i think there's some similarities between these three guys but there's also some differences some big differences when i look at like Embiid has already kind of made a few little comments but there's the james Mm -hmm. harden mess to deal with right there's 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 that whole situation who knows where that's going to go if you're joel Embiid, you're looking at that going man i don't know what the what the future holds here with luca yeah, they've been struggling to put another player with him. Is Kyrie the guy or not? You know, but again, that's probably a few years down the road. With Dame, he spent a ton of what, a decade right in Portland trying to figure out can this work? Can they build a team around him? The answer clearly has been no. It's finally, you know, we were saying maybe years ago it'd be time to move on. Finally, they're they're moving on. The the ship is sailing. Um, with Giannis though, Gian, it what is it that he wants? Right when I look at what the Bucks have done now, maybe Giannis is trying to project out like a few years from now, and maybe he's worried about the cupboard being bare at that point. As guys like Brooke Lopez and Drew Holiday they get older, and Giannis himself is what like twenty nine, so he's getting up there too. Maybe he's trying to look ahead to a few years from now. But Chris Middleton got paid, Brooke Lopez got paid. It doesn't seem like the Bucks are being cheap here on, on players. What what is Giannis actually concerned about? Like you said, they're projected to be one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference. Some people would have them as the favorite to win the title, despite what happened last season. I, I'm trying to connect the dots here and figure out what it is that Giannis is not happy or what it is that the Bucs have not done. Yeah, my sense listening to him talk 
<clears throat> excuse me, and those kind of things is I don't get the sense that he's unhappy. Mm-hmm. I more think this is the, hey, you better keep doing these things. You know, when Drew Holiday is extension eligible or becomes a free agent this summer, you better not cheap out and say, well, you know, we're, we're going to go a different direction. We're going to bring in, you know, a mid-level point guard instead. And Drew Holiday, that's just too much. I think Giannis is basically letting the Bucks know, hey, I like what you've done to this point. We're a title contender. But this is my expectation for the remaining years of you know my career, uh, at least my next full contract, I expect to be a title contender. And you have basically a two-year window to continue to prove to me that's where you want to be. So I don't get the sense that he's saying, hey, you haven't done enough. Because I would, and if I was the Bucs, I'd be like, all right, dude, what exactly did you want us to exactly. do? Right? So I think it's more of a, you better keep doing these things. Otherwise, we're going to have a different conversation that's probably not going to be you know, one you really want to face. Well, I guess particularly when the when the topic of a contract extension is what is what's coming up here, and he's saying I'm not going to sign it this summer, maybe next. He's just trying to keep that pressure on to make sure, hey, we're not taking our foot off the gas pedal here anytime mm-hmm. soon. Because if we do, if we do, then that's a different conversation that we're going to have. But I, I do think that's a, a differentiator here because it seems like the Bucks have done pretty much everything they can. Sure. Uh, to, to build a winner around Giannis. Uh, again, the 76ers having the hardened turmoil and that whole situation to deal with. The Blazers, I- even the the Mavs, I mean, they haven't... Like, Giannis has won it, has won it with, with the Bucks. So it <laughs> yeah. just, it, to me, that situation stands apart from the other ones as a, an intriguing one. And I'm curious to see what he says on media day, if there's even a little bit more clarity brought to the situation at that point. Completely agreed. Yeah, and I think what you'd be looking for if you're a Bucks fan or even the Bucks front office is just a, all I want is to continue to push, right? Yeah. That's what I'm asking for here. I'm asking for that commitment because I get it. If you're Giannis, yeah, I think he's seeing it as, all right, I got to kind of read the landscape a little bit here. Brooke Lopez is going to age out eventually. You know, that's going to happen sometime within probably the next three, maybe four seasons at the latest. So I think if you're Giannis, you're, you're starting to look at it like, all right, we got Middleton, holidays, really expensive. I'm really expensive. At some point, with all the stuff that's going on around the league, we're not Golden State or the Lakers or the Nets or the Knicks. We're not in that massive big market where we can carry a 200 plus million dollar payroll every single season into the year and be, you know, 20, 30 million into the tax. So I think he's probably looking at it and saying, all right, where, you know, well, what is the goals here? And I think Giannis is probably also a little bit in his mind of, I got you a title and I've, I've given you more than a decade, right? This is year 11 for him, which is somehow also completely mind boggling that this is year 11 for Giannis. <laughs> right? When I so, saw he's yeah. 29, I was like, how, how is he? Tw-? I still think of him as like 27, something exactly, like that. Yeah. It's crazy. I, I, you could have told me he was 26 and I would have been like, all right, yeah, I came in at 18 and this is right. year eight or whatever. And yeah, but yeah, he's going to be 29. So, so we're just in a spot where I think with Giannis, yeah, we're, we're, he, he's just putting the bucks on notice a little bit here, right. Of, you know, here, here we are. And, and, you know, that's to me, that's not the end of the world. I think that is a, Hey, this is what my expectations are. If we're not going to be on board, then let's start this conversation. So it doesn't become a Damian Lillard situation where it is. I know the Damian Lillard thing didn't happen out of nowhere entirely, but mm-hmm. you don't want it to be, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then all of a sudden, no, I'm not. And here we are. They want, like, I think he's like, hey, I'm giving you a two years notice here on that. And then I laid out in a piece for spot track. I reshared it today. Um, so it's very easy to find but all his contractual options, all the different things he can do if he wanted to extend, you know, right now, if he wanted to extend after the season, if he wanted to, you know, take it into free agency, I laid all that stuff out there. So everybody can check that out if they want. All right. And you're right. He is 28 right now, turning 29 in, in December. Giannis is. Um, we had another player pop up on the trade market late. Can, can I say one other crazy thing too? Oh, you can always Giannis say crazy start. things on, on this show. <laughs> Did, did this is like a Giannis and Bede thing that I didn't realize until just today? Uh-huh. And Bede is nine months to the day older than Giannis. That is That's weird. Kind of crazy. And and then I want to go back to one other thing with Embiid too. I 
if Embiid was to ask for a trade, I think I would get it just from his entirety of his time in Philadelphia has basically been a circus, right? You had mm-hmm. him missing time early because of injuries and the sure. whole hinky plan that they were working through. Yeah. That fell apart. And then you had the whole Colangelo mess. Mm-hmm. Then you had the Ben Simmons situation, which dragged on forever. It felt like now you've got the Harden situation. I could see Joel Embiid basically being like, hey, the same kind of deal. Like, I gave you a decade, man. Like, this is a mess. I'm ready to go do something else. Ironically, you know what pops into my head when you say that? I wonder if Joel Embiid looks at Giannis and, and craves the consistency that Giannis has had with the Bucks, which is funny because we, we, you know, that's that's probably what he would be looking for is a team that's that's consistently paid to keep the players around their guy and and has shown that they're gonna they're gonna do what they can to win and all that. And I know things didn't work out for the Bucks the way they wanted to last year, but if you're Joel Embiid. I could see where you look over what is happening with or what's happened with Giannis and you could find that appealing. Whereas Giannis is, you know, saying, Hey, you better <laughs> keep doing this. Otherwise, otherwise yeah. uh, Joel and I are, are both going to be out there on the, on the trade market. So yeah, that's, that's a good point though, that Embiid has definitely dealt with a lot of turmoil. He is the process, but um, man, we'll see what happens. The Harden situation is going to be a big factor here with, with all yeah. of that too. How do how does this all work itself out? Does it? When does it? Yikes. Yikes. Big things to deal with yep. there. All right. Let's jump over to the the actual trade market that's happening right now, not in the future, but Buddy Heald and the Pacers working on a trade. Heald is making just over $19 million this season, $19.3 million if we round up, and was not able to come to terms on a contract extension with the Pacers. And so the two sides are working on a trade. Keith, kind of difficult. This time of year, you know, we're a very short time before training camps are kicking off for teams. You've got all the players who signed their contracts over the summer aren't trade eligible. So it's not easy to get a deal done this time of year in the NBA. But as we're seeing with the Damian Lillard situation, teams will still attempt to to do it. Um, What do you think of this whole thing with, with Buddy Heald and... And the Pacers, do they actually find a new landing spot for Heal? Because twenty, almost twenty million dollars, and he's not a Damian Lillard level player. That's that's a lot of money to throw around this time of year. Yeah, it's a lot of money, but it's not an impossible amount of money to sure. move, which is good, right? You, well, it's now really once you get north of thirty is when it starts to get a little more tricky until everybody frees up to be traded. Which, just as a reminder to everybody, December fifteenth is when the vast majority of the players who signed over the summer can be traded. They, it's it's generally uh, three months, but they do three months or December 15th, whichever is later. Because the idea is they don't want you, you know, hey, we signed a guy for $25 million, you know, if the Pacers were like, we signed Bruce Brown, and now we're going to trade him, you know, months later before he even mm-hmm. debuted. Like, that's not the idea. So so it's December 15th is really, that's kind of when the trade trade season opens in the NBA. So with this one with Buddy Heald, it was funny because I don't know if you caught this. I, I was alerted to it um, by listening to a podcast that Caitlin Cooper was on, um, who does wonderful work covering the Pacers. She you know, does an incredible job uh, covering them. But one of the things that she she said was Benedict Matherin is out there telling everybody in interviews, I'm going to start next year. Like they've told me mm-hmm. I'm going to be a starter. So it was like, huh. All right. Well, we know Halliburton and Turner are going to start. We know Bruce Brown's probably going to start because of the money they gave him. So there's three spots. If it, you're probably going with one of the the fours, either Obi Toppin or Jarris Walker, you know, well, one of the two of those guys. So then that turns into, all right, so that's, yeah, I would have just assumed, well, Buddy Heald will start and they'll, you know, Heald and, and Brown will be interchangeable two, three players. And that'll just be kind of how it goes. But Matherin, you know, has been you know, loud that he's going to start. I looked it up after, and he really has been saying it. So I started looking at him like, all right. Then you got Andrew Nemhard to factor in there. He started a lot of last mm-hmm. year. The Pacers, if you didn't watch the Pacers last year, they started basically with Miles Turner and then four guards and wings around him almost, you know, every meaningful game they played uh, last season. So really through, what, the beginning to middle of March. So – you start to look at it and it's like, okay, you know, if I'm Buddy Heald, I, I have to wonder, 
and Buddy Heald say, well, let's get an extension done so I can lock in. Um, you know, I'm signed up here. Or did Buddy Heald look at it and say, eh, if we can't get this extension done, I want to go because Matherin's going to start. And now I'm just a guy who's coming off the bench and playing 25 you know, minutes a night, like mm-hmm. that's not necessarily going to land me a 20 plus million dollar deal. So just the timing of all of this stuff seems to be, all right, no extension could be reached. And I think if you're the Pacers, you're looking at it and saying, we have Matherin, they have Aaron Neesmith, who they like, they have Andrew Nemhard, who they like quite a bit. They still have TJ McConnell on this roster. You obviously have Hal Burton. You, you signed Bruce Brown. They're probably saying, yeah, I don't know that we want to lock in, you know, 20 plus million yeah. a year for yet another guard. And really, as much as I like Buddy Heald, he's really kind of a one skill or two skill, uh, you know, player where he's a shooter and scorer. He doesn't give you a whole lot else uh, on the floor. He's a better playmaker than people give him credit for. But that's really kind of it. So I kind of wonder if that's how this all came together. But And Matherin, it makes sense for him to start. I mean, he's, you know, 21 and. But look, he was with the Pacers, so maybe didn't get quite as much shine as he should. But 17 and four last season as a yep. rookie, I mean, that's especially if you're a team like the Pacers that right now is kind of on the upswing or trying to get onto the upswing. Him, like him hitting the next level, is what's going to put your as a team into that next level. Getting the yep. same old out of Buddy Heald is not going to move you up up a rung into like the playoff race in the Eastern Conference. So it makes a lot of sense, I think, for them to to move Matherin into that starting lineup. But what's the well, trade market? Point what's two, that? sorry, I just want to add, there was a lot of people giving buzz to Benedict Matherin as the year went along for like, he should be getting more rookie of the year. Like, yeah. It really kind of, most people had said, this is Paulo Bancaro's going to win rookie of the year. And then he had a little bit of Walker Kessler, um, you know, steam pick up late in the year. But the other guy that a handful of people were like, I kind of think Matherin should be in the mix. So you're absolutely right. Like he's a guy who at some point it was, all right, he's going to force himself into a bigger role. It was not going to continue to be, I will play. Let's see. Last year he played, 28 minutes a night, but only started 17 games and mm-hmm. played in 78 games. So he was not going to continue to be a, you know, just come off the bench guy. He was going to force himself into a bigger role one way or another. So now my question is, what is Buddy Heald's trade market? Because there's two very different things going on here. If if teams are looking at Buddy Heald as a one-year rental, that's that's going to be one value for him, right? The price tag on him is going to be X if teams are looking at him as a one-year rental and then we move on. If teams, though, are saying we want Buddy Heald to keep him and therefore we have to be willing to give him the contract extension that clearly the Pacers think is too much, whatever the number is, clearly the Pacers think it's too much. Otherwise, they would just give it to him if they're willing to give him a contract extension. So if you're a team that's looking to keep him long-term, you have to not only want Buddy Heald, not only have movable assets right now to get Buddy Heald, but also be willing to pay him what he wants into the future as well on a contract extension. So how do we reconcile all of that? Is he? Do you think he's going to be more the one-year rental guy and then he hits the free agent market next summer? Or do you think there's, there is a team out there that says, yes, we want Buddy Heald, we will give up assets for him, and we're willing to give him the extension that he wants? I I think it's probably the second, but there are a couple teams you could talk me into saying, let's bring him in for this year and then we'll see where it goes. Uh, I I think, oddly enough, we talked about one of them. I think Milwaukee could be one Mm -hmm. of those. I think you could maybe see Indiana and jump in if there was like, is there a third team that needs to be in here to route, um, you know, Buddy Heald somewhere so that a Lillard trade or a Harden trade Mm -hmm. can get done. You know, because that's again 19 million is a nice piece, and I think he's a guy who could make a ton of sense um, for other teams if they wanted to get him. Um, you know, in in kind of just in their program, I, I just looked it up. He's been remarkably durable throughout his career: 82 games, 80 games, 82 games, 72 games, 71 games. Those are both pandemic shortened seasons. 81 games and 80 games. So, like, dude just doesn't miss time. He is an absolute elite uh, three-point shooter. I think mm-hmm. the stat that was making the rounds yesterday when this came out was uh, only Stephen Curry and I apologize. I forget who the other guy was. 
have made more three pointers than him over the last five seasons. Now, I mean, look at look at this. Forty three percent from three last season. Yeah. On eight and a half attempts. Yeah. Like this isn't like he shoots two threes a game and he like eight and a half attempts is absurd. And he's a 40 percent three point shooter for his career. Yeah. Now, that said, though, remember, he came in as a, quote, old rookie. Right. So he that's was 24 where when he came in. You know, yeah. And well, and, you know, <laughs> we had that whole age uh, controversy Correct. with him yes. back in the day. So that's the challenge. He'll be 31 he's, in December. Yes. So now you're starting to be like, all right, you know. How much is going to keep up? But again, really, you're talking about a guy's a one, two skill player. He's a shooter scorer. That's really what he is. So I think you, I would feel good about saying, yeah, we can give him 20 million AAV, you know, over the next, you know, three years in an extension and feel really good about that if we trade for him because that'll hold value. He should still be, you know, an absolute elite shooter. That shouldn't go away. It's just going to be, you have to be a team that's like, we can either cover for him in big, important games, i.e. playoff games, or we can, you know, we, we, we're we really good with we need him for the regular season bump is where we need to be. So that's where I, I think, you know, just about any team should be interested in kind of going in on a guy like this because I think he makes a ton of sense uh, for a lot of teams. It's just going to be, yeah, to, your, to the question you asked is, are you acquiring him for – already loads up. If this goes into the season, it becomes more likely a team says, yeah, we're getting buddy healed for the stretch run. We need a shooter. That's the last thing we're missing mm -hmm. to be a title contender. Then you see, see it kind of go that way. Or if it happens now, it's probably more likely, Hey, we're getting him because we think he's going to help us now. And we think he'll hold his value at least for the next few seasons. And we kind of go that way. If a trade doesn't go down in the next week and a half or so, it makes Pacers media day. Another one to keep it up. We've got so many media days to keep this super close eye on. Um, if it doesn't happen the next week and a half or so, yeah, Pacers media day becomes all the more interesting. But we'll see if uh, if he ultimately gets moved here or not. But like you said, he's an elite shooter, and that's a skill that teams are looking for. But obviously yep. there's some other factors here that are going to determine ultimately what the value is the Pacers are going to get for him. Uh, we do have some injury news. Uh, Alexei Pokushevsky is out for six weeks. Keith, he just – Injuries tend to pop up <laughs> for, for him. Yeah. Such an interesting player, too. You hate to see it, especially this close. This is where now you're talking about losing time in training camp. This is where it's, is he back for the start of the regular season? Probably not. Are you behind the eight ball once the season gets rolling? That's it, It's not good when you see six-week injuries pop up this time of year. Yeah, and he was a guy who showed real progress last year, I thought, before he got mm -hmm. hurt. And then he had a couple different injuries last year. This is now a uh, – sounds like a pretty severely sprained right ankle. And this is a Thunder team that they're loaded, right? They, they have so many guys. It's just going to be hard for him to start from behind like this. If I don't know – if this was the last couple years with the Thunder, they – basically played everybody on their roster. Like everyone got a chance because they were in evaluation mode. They were yep. really let's, you know, cycle guys through. And, you know, sometimes guys completely sat out for a week and then they were back in the rotation for an entire week. Sometimes the lineups were getting really kind of jumbled around. I think this year might be a little bit more of a, or we've done most of the evaluating. We've got a little bit of that to do at the back end of the roster, the, the, the back half, I should say. And, but we're really trying to push forward and now he's just not going to be part of it from the jump. And that, that becomes a little bit of a challenge. He is extension eligible. I don't expect there to be an extension because it'd have to be so team friendly yeah. right now with where he's at, that it probably doesn't even make sense for him, but yeah, you just never want to see, you know, a guy like this young guy kind of, you know, behind the eight ball, the star training camp, it just makes a little bit of a mess of things for him. And this could be the, Sort, sort of the beginning of the end for his term in, in Oklahoma City because as we've talked, our roster spots are getting tight, yeah. all those other things. I'm not suggesting right now, but just no extension comes and then they just kind of go their separate ways this summer. Yeah, yeah, certainly something to keep an eye on with that whole situation, especially OKC is, again, high on my league pass rankings. They're a team that I definitely want to keep a close eye on, but this is definitely a bummer to see him out for these six weeks, and that means – no preseason, probably no beginning of the regular season. And then what if the Thunder pun intended here, I guess. What if the Thunder start rolling uh to start the to start the year? 
Um, yeah. how, what does that, that look like at that point? And I think you're right. SGA is ready to win right now. And I think they've got pieces now that, that can put them in the mix in the Western Conference. Are you going to try to reintegrate uh, Pokashevsky at that point? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Um, Especially when you have other guys, right? It's, yeah. This is not just, you know, I don't think he's any more the one of the crown jewels in their rebuild, right? I think it's now, hey, if he pops, great. We're happy to have him. But I think they've he's far enough down the organizational pecking order that his status no longer just gets him playing time. He's going to have to come back and earn it and have to be better than somebody else. And it's just hard to do when you miss the start of the year. All right, Malcolm Brogdon, a little clarification on him being upset with the Celtics. Initially, it was thought that he was upset because he was on the trade block and was almost traded to the, the Clippers. No, uh, according to Ramona Shelburne, that's not what the problem was. The problem is the handling of his elbow injury. That's what he's not happy with the Boston Celtics about. Keith, you're the Celtics guy. What's what's going on here? I don't know. I You know, I really don't know. It's funny. I... It's anytime there is a bad news report about a team, instantly that team's fans start to discredit the reporter. They have yep. no connections. They don't know what they're talking about. It's false. You know, this is they're making true. it up. Yep. And more often than not, we end up finding out down the line. You no, know, they were pretty on it, right? They, they, they were, they, they, they had, you know, most of the story out there and those kind of things. I, I could see this being true. I would hope Malcolm Brogdon at this point would understand a trade talks happen. Now, this one's a little different because he he was traded, let's be real. Like, it was done, and then the Clippers backed out. So this wasn't mm -hmm. just, you know, yeah, we were talking and nothing happened. This was this was a done deal. The, him being upset about his injury, I would just like, maybe we'll get it at media day in a you know, week and a half. I'd like a little more, what is it that's going on there? Did he want surgery? Yeah. And the team said, no, just rehab it. That's generally not the way that goes. That's usually the other way around. Way around. Yeah. You know, it's almost always the players like, let me rehab and see how it goes versus going under the knife. Was he upset that, you know, they, they basically did, they stopped playing him uh, down the stretch after he got hurt against the heat because he just couldn't be effective. So I, I'm not entirely sure, you know, where this is. I will say this, this is pretty high on the order for the Celtics of, you got to do some relationship repair here because if he's going to be there, he's going to be a big, big part of the team. Mm -hmm. One six man of the year award last year. He's going to be in the same role this year. You need him fully bought in and ready to go. And if he can't get there, then you really need to start looking at, all right, what, what can we do trade wise with this? And I'll throw cold water all over all the Celtics fans who were in my mentions last night. No, the Indiana Pacers are not taking them back in the trade. Yeah. Buddy healed unless Boston gets really ridiculous with you know throwing away first round picks in the deal like that. I mean, Malcolm Brogdon is a really good player, yeah, uh, and he just you know obviously the health is a concern, but I look at Brogdon's skill set and, and I think the Celtics probably need him now more than ever because you lost Marcus Smart and you need another guy that can handle the ball a little bit that can go in there and do some, and do some things for you. By the way. Do you buy the Jason Tatum's going to spend a bunch of minutes at point guard thing? I think the phrasing is odd there. I, I think it's Jason Tatum is going to initiate the offense yes. a lot. I think that's the yep. way I would put that. He, he's not going to play point guard. He's just not going to defend point mm -hmm. guards on the other end of the floor. But Jason Tatum initiating the offense more. more. Sure, I think him and Jalen Brown both, both will. I think that is where the – bulk of the making up for Marcus Smart's playmaking ability comes from is those two doing more, especially in the half court with Derek White really taking over the transition type play and all that. I mean, Derek White, I think it's gotten a little bit lost because his last couple of years in San Antonio, he seeded a lot of the on-ball stuff to DeJounte Murray and then really was kind of in a very different role when Boston where he was quite often the fourth or fifth option on the floor. But Derek White is a point guard. Like that's what he's always been in his career has been a guy who can run an offense and he's really good in transition. It just hasn't been his role. But yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to see, I think people took that to be, they're going to roll out, you know, lineups of Porzingis, Horford, White, you know, another forward, you know, in the mix and then Tatum at the one, like, I don't think that's going to be the case, but initiating the offense. Sure. I think that'll definitely be a thing. You know, I think it, it's funny that when we, most fans out there, when we talk position, they think offense. 
And that's not really the way it should be. When, the only time that I think of position in terms of point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center, right? The traditional positions, it's who are you defending? Yep. Because on offense in today's NBA, you've got so many guys that can do so many different things that's atypical of their their traditional like archetypal role, right? You've got you've got guys who are seven feet tall that are shooting threes and and throwing no look passes in today's NBA. You can be it's more who's the offensive initiator, right? That you're that you're really asking about. And that way, I mean it's kind of similar to the way the Lakers, like people were calling LeBron a point guard in 2020. Was he defending? The quick point guards of the NBA? No, not at all. But is he an offensive initiator? Yes. And so in that way, I can see that that making sense for the Celtics as well to use Tatum in that role. And part of that is out of necessity. But like you said, Derek White can obviously be a big guy uh, at that point too. Certainly somebody I'm keeping an eye on Derek White for uh, for fantasy basketball if he is given that that role and you know gets the bump up in terms of the uh, the usage rate as well. Yeah, and sneaky because he's going to get assists and blocks too. And yep. in that way, he's the best shot blocking guard in the league, along with SGA. You know, they're they're one one a. You know, take your pick. I'm good with either one of them. I would say, hey, here's how I think of these things. I think of defense as positions, offense as roles. Like, and they're different things. Like on on offense, you have what what your role is on offense, and then defensively, I think of all right, what can you guard. You know, mm-hmm. what, what positions can you guard? And I know that sounds a little weird because if it's like if you're saying they're guarding a position, somebody has to be playing in that position. But I, I think it just, you know, you start to make it, it it's all just blended together. I, I'm not yeah. the kind of person who's gone as far as, you know, basketball is completely positionless and all that because no. I don't believe that it is. I think what you have is I think, and this goes all the way back to when he started in Boston as their head coach. Brad Stevens was asked about and he they asked about positions his very first year when they were terrible. And one of the things he said was, yeah, I don't really think of it that way. He goes, I think of guys in grouped into buckets of ball handlers, wings, bigs, mm-hmm. and swings. And the swings were you you're a big or a wing, you're a wing or a ball handler, uh, was the way he thinks of them. And that's kind of been the way I've adapted my thinking towards the league a little bit because yeah, you still have guys who are in the, but those are roles, right? Though those are stretch bigs. They're ball handling wings. They're you know playmaking wings. They're shooting, um, you know you know bigs or whatever it is. Shooting, uh, you know smalls. However you want to put it that way. Those are the ways I kind of think through things a little bit more. So yeah, that's where I always laugh. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, if we're gonna say LeBron's the point, LeBron's been the point guard then his entire career. Because right. that's what he's always done. But he's rare. And yes, I realize he's picked up point guards at times in playoff series and in the sure. light. But he's never been like line. They've they've never gone out there and said, all right, Chase Steph, all game no. long. Right, right, it right. might be Chase Steph for the last, you know, two minutes of a game. Sure, mm-hmm. that might be a thing. But yeah, so it's you know, that that to me that's a role versus a position, but you know, that's probably a little deeper than people really wanted us to go on that topic. Well, you know, I mean it's something that is it, it matters in terms of how we analyze the game, right? Because sure. we still have a lot of people who say, oh, well, if you're the point guard, then your job is to handle the ball and to set up <laughs> teammates and you have to be the yeah. best passer. And that's just not that's not really the NBA world that we live in at this stage. But yet those those sorts of, of things persist. So anyway, it was worth talking about. But I had a book when I was a kid that was it was called Explaining Sports and it uh-huh. explained positions in every sport and it was so outdated because it was like fullbacks like the way i think this book might have been my dad's when he was a kid but it was like fullbacks were still like the big thing in football like Mm -hmm. they were your primary ball handler or ball carrier and all that stuff but what it said for basketball was it said um guards pass and score uh center score and rebound forwards pass and rebound like that was literally like how it was like determined <laughs> like back then, which if you think about it at its most simple core, sure. like I think that's, that's probably somewhat true. It's funny too. You know, I asked um my, uh, somebody asked me, the other day, like, why do they call them front court and back court players? And I was like, Oh, I, I said, the reason why is because when the game initially started, you had your front court players were, they could only play in the front court. They were your offensive players and they were generally your biggest players because you threw the ball down to them so they could score. And it was funny. I always think back to when my mom played high school basketball. No, my mom's not a hundred years old. Offense and defense. They had, they played six players and it was offense and defense. You could in the three could only go, you know, up to 
half court and could only come as far back as half court on the other end of the floor. And that was how it was played. It was like, it, it, it reminds me of like foosball where you're locked into your bit, position, yeah. but, but basketball. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll wrap things up there. Get, having gotten into all kinds of crazy, that is that'll be an interesting time. Next August, we'll we'll go further in depth <laughs> into into that. But um, like basketball terminology and all basketball that. Basketball term. Yeah, we'll talk. Of, we'll we'll break out sure. the peach bas- baskets and we'll uh, yeah, we'll have a good time. But I've uh, always wanted you. the NBA. Maybe they could do it at All Star Weekend to play. And maybe it's a celebrity game or something or a retired players game. Play one game with the original rules. Like play a game with oh, the original man. rules of basketball. Like where it was like, because there was no dribbling. Like that wasn't a thing. Like it just, just to see, you know, like it, I you, by no means am I suggesting let's do this even in a preseason NBA game, but just, you know, one game, an exhibition for fun, you know, play with the original rules and like have them wear like the, you know, the, the, the bloomers and the high socks and all that stuff. I just think it would be fun. How are you going to get to do this? I don't know. You're, you're, you're going to get, do it. You're, you're gonna get the veteran, the guys who are, are like retired NBA players. Yeah. They're going to be like, man, how old do you think I am? Yeah, you're sure. me, you know, you're there. Me all this stuff. have fun. You can put, put a ladder out there by the hoop so somebody can climb up every time somebody makes a basket. Yes, 100%. And figures out to cut a hole yes. in it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then, then like maybe at like halftime, somebody comes out with a saw and is like, cut a hole in this thing. And it'll fall right through. Right. And then you kind of play it out that way. I, thought, yeah, I always thought that'd be kind of fun. Maybe you play like a, like a quarter, the old, like with the original rules, then you cut the hole in and play the second quarter front court and then back court. Then, then you introduce like the three point shot and you just kind of keep going. I, I don't know. I just the, thought it'd be fun. The NBA all-star weekend presented by the history channel. That's, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what, is. that's what we're going to. Yeah. Keith, yeah, you, you, you to... have, you've had some wonderful ideas <laughs> on this show. This is not one of them. <laughs> this is not one of them. <laughs> I think it's, I think it'd be fun. I, I don't know for charity or something. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it'd be me and me and my mom watching and she'd be like, that was my position. Right there. I was the, the backcourt left player or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> center backcourt player. Everybody, yeah. let us know in the chat. Would you watch <laughs> Keith's old timey basketball exhibition? I bet people during say they will. Would would yeah. this be better than the actual NBA All Star game? It'd be better it, than the celebrity it, game. I it think. might be. Well, yeah, that's that's for sure. <laughs> See? But. See, now I'm winning you over. You're kind of like, oh, all right, all right, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> but we got to set the bar so low. Last year's All-Star game was awful, and the celebrity game is always awful. We're setting a super low bar there. <laughs> that's it. That's how you That's how you start out successful. You set a low bar, and then that way you jump right over it versus trying to you know, climb over a high bar. Come on. Uh, nobody is jumping in that game, Keith. I think nope. that's that's for sure. Yeah, I think that maybe, <laughs> maybe that's one of the quarters. There's no jump shots. Allowed, I don't even know if they had the Fosbury flop at, at that point to, to get over yeah, the bar. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. Let's see. Man, All right. We're, we're going, way, here. We're going hey, way into history at this point. Two pieces of good news. Yeah. At this time, we're recording this. It is now 149 Eastern. Two weeks from now, we'll be like starting like like into the second half of the first preseason game mm-hmm. of the year. First preseason game two weeks from, from today on the 5th at uh, noontime. D- Dallas and Minnesota from uh, from Dubai. So let, let's go. We're, we're almost there to, to preseason action. They start training camp in like a week. Um, because they, they get to start a little earlier because those two teams are going uh, overseas. So that'll be be uh, fun you know, stories. We'll get you know, to hear from Kyrie and contract and you know all that stuff. And then I'm interested in Minnesota's media day. Jaden McDaniels, mm-hmm. still no extension, you know, his rookie skill. The other piece of good news, this is just, I'm going to humble brag on myself for a minute there. This is a T-shirt I could not fit into um, for a long, long time. So I'm psyched, man. This is awesome. this is a t-shirt that I've dropped enough weight to be able to fit into. And it's been just sitting in the drawer. And I was like, I'm gonna try it today and just see. And it fits pretty good. So I'm, Congrats, I'm a happy man. guy. Yeah. That that we're, that's we're making progress. fantastic. Great stuff, man. Great stuff. Yeah. Uh that's uh that's a good feeling. That's a good yeah, feeling big for time. sure. Big time. Great way, great way to end the show, too, on, on a positive note there. Um, instead of old timey peach instead of old timey basketball we we get to celebrate keith's accomplishment all right 
Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Make sure that you do subscribe over on the YouTube channel, also over on the podcast feed. Thank you again, everybody. Till next time. See ya and stay safe.